owing also on, on sort of trying to find a kind of a good marriage between macro and finance, uh, combining insights from both fields to, uh, to push the, the boundaries of our knowledge. So please. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this conference. I'm going to present this paper, which is joint with Francois Goriot at the Chicago Fed, and it's called Accounting for Macrofinance Trends, Market Power, Intangibles, and Risk Premium. So I want to show you a couple of stylized facts by way of introduction. The first one, uh, you've probably seen a graph of this sort uh, thousands of times over. It documents the decline in the real interest rate in the US, but that's a worldwide phenomenon. Uh, since uh, the early 80s. And a lot has been written uh, as uh, what could be causing uh, this decline. A lot of the potential explanations have been proposed. Uh, for example, uh, one prominent explanation is an increase in the worldwide supply of savings, perhaps driven by demographics or by excess savings in, uh, in emerging markets. One thing that's surprising, though, especially if you're coming at it from the perspective of this explanation, is that not all rate of returns seems to have declined uh, in parallel. So in particular, if you try to estimate the return to private capital in the economy, uh, you find something that's more or less stable. So this graph sort of documents the diverging trends between the real interest rates, that's the blue line, and you see that it's declining over the sample, and the red line, which is uh, a rough measure of the marginal product of capital, which is uh, due to Gom, Rupert, and Ravi Kumar at the St. Louis Fed. And what they do essentially is to compute the profit rate in this economy. So you look at the part of income that's not going to labor, and you divide that by the value of the capital stock. And that gives you a measure of the return to capital. You see that there are some ups and downs, but there's certainly don't, no downward trend uh, in this return. So you have a growing gap between uh, the risk-free rate and the return uh, on private capital, which again is surprising. Uh, if you think that the driver for the decline in real interest rates is an increase in savings that should drive all rates of returns down uh, in parallel, and this is not what we're seeing. So something else uh, must be going on. Another thing that's surprising, uh, and this comes really from uh, looking at financial data, is that uh, stock valuations have only increased moderately uh, over the sample. So this is plotting the price dividend ratio uh, in the US. And uh, you see that there's a lot of volatility uh, in the late 90s. That's the NASDAQ bubble. But if, if you remove that, there's a bit of an increase in the price dividend ratio over the sample, but only uh, a moderate increase. And again, that's surprising if you come at this uh, from the perspective of the fact that there's been an increase in the worldwide supply of savings, because that should have driven interest rates down a lot, and that should have driven valuations up a lot. And in fact, we only see a slight increase in valuations. So the price dividend ratio is high uh, but from a historical perspective. But if you confront this price dividend ratio with the very low level of interest rates far into the future, it's actually relatively low. So again, something else uh, must be going on. Uh, and yet another fact that's uh, a bit surprising and a bit uh, inconsistent with this increase uh, in savings supply uh, hypothesis is that investment has remained uh, very tepid. So this is a plot of the investment to GDP ratio. And you see that it's stable or declining a bit. Uh, and that's not consistent, again, with an increase uh, in the global supply of savings, which should drive up uh, the capital stock uh, and the investment rate. So uh, once again, uh, something else seems to be going on. So uh, there's been a lot written over the past uh, 20 years, especially over the past 10 years, uh, about these different facts. And here I've listed some of the prominent uh, hypotheses or explanations that have been put forward. For example, uh, the global savings glut, or uh, slowing productivity growth, rising market power. Uh, that was the topic of the recent Jackson Hole conference. Uh, 
uh, technical change, the rise of uh, intangibles, uh, and uh, a smaller literature on uh, maybe some secular trend uh, in risk premium. So all these explanations and all these papers pretty much focus on a subset of these facts, one or two. And what we want to do instead is to look at all these facts jointly because we think that these explanations have uh, ripple effects in, uh, for all these different facts. Okay, so if you try, for example, to explain the decline in interest rates by an increase in the world supply of savings, then you're going to have to confront uh, the fact that investment didn't increase all that much and, and things of that sort. So we think it's important to look at these things jointly. And in particular, we think it's important to look at macro facts and finance facts jointly. And uh, you'll see that I'll draw a, a very stark comparison in the sort of exercises that you can do if you uh, try to impose the discipline of fi matching financial moments uh, uh, compared to an exercise where you discard these moments and say, look, finance is too complicated. I'm just going to do the macro. And you're going to be led to very different uh, uh, conclusions. So uh, that's what we're going to do today. Uh, I'm going to document. Uh, some of these macro finance trends. So some of them I already showed you. Uh, there are a few more. And then I'm going to put forth uh, a very simple model, a uh, really like a, an accounting framework, which is going to be uh, a little modification of the neoclassical growth model, and uh, try to estimate uh, this little model and uh, show you some uh, baseline results, some counterfactuals. The baseline is not going to allow for intangibles. Uh, I'll introduce that later uh, as an extension, and you'll see that we're going to be led to the conclusion that it didn't play a major role for the sort of things that uh, we're looking at, which is the reason why we're uh, leaving it out of the baseline. Then I'll compare our macro finance exercise with the macro macro uh, exercise, and I'll try to explain that the, why uh, the macro finance uh, exercise is much more sensible and leads to a much more sensible conclusion. Uh, and then uh, I'll wrap up by uh, showing you some more reduced form uh, related evidence for one of the things that we're going to emphasize as being important, which is uh, uh, an increase, uh, a secular increase in risk premium. So uh, we're going to split the sample. Uh, in 2000, and we're going to start the sample in 84. So the reason we're not starting in 1980 is because there's a lot going on with uh, inflation in the very early 80s, and that's pretty much uh, over by the mid-80s. So that's the reason for, for these dates. Uh, later on during the talk, I will show you uh, some estimates that go back in time uh, to the 1950s. So uh, you see uh, the, the averages of these different variables on these two samples. And the last column is the change in these variables. So you can recognize in this form the trends that I already talked about, the decline in the interest rate, uh, the relative stability of gross profitability, the fact that the price dividend ratio has only increased slightly, the fact that investment to output uh, has gone down, but investment to capital is relatively stable, declined just a little bit. A fact that is very important and has been discussed a lot that in Cho is the decline in the labor share. So it's very significant. There's a, a four percentage point decline uh, in the labor share between the two samples. And uh, there's another little thing that's going to play some role uh, is the fact that if you look at the relative growth, the, the price in the relative, uh, the, the growth in the relative price of investment goods, it used to decline a lot during the first part of the sample, and that rate of decline slowed down. Okay, so there's less like investment-specific technical change than uh, there used to be, but the effect is not, uh, is not major. So uh, we want to account for all these things together and try to understand what structural underlying uh, phenomena might, might be driving them. Uh, and it's very important to look at them jointly, as you will see. So we're going to uh, use this uh, accounting framework. And uh, in this accounting framework, we want to make room for uh, the, the most prominent explanations that have been put forth to explain some of these phenomena. In particular, we want to allow for market power, 
and we want to allow for uh, risk aversion, risk premia, and things like that. That's going to be the finance part of the model. And this is going to motivate these small extensions that we're going to do to the neoclassical growth model. So we're going to introduce monopolistic competition, that's to make room for market power. And we're going to introduce Epstein's inutility and some risk. And the risk is going to take a specific form, and that's mostly for tractability. It's going to combine productivity shock and capital quality shocks. And I'll show you exactly why that particular formulation is, uh, is tractable for us. So Epstein's inutility is important because if you want to match these asset pricing facts, it's very important to disentangle attitudes towards intertemporal substitution and attitudes towards risk. And Epstein's inutility uh, allows you to do that. So given this model, what uh, we're going to be able to characterize is a, a risky steady state where all the big ratios, uh, the macro big ratios and some finance big ratios are going to be constant. Uh, and we're going to be able to pin down this uh, risky steady state in closed form. So it's going to be very transparent the way the model operates and very transparent the way uh, the parameters are going to be recovered from uh, the estimation. So I'm not going to give you the full details of the model, but I want to give you a gist of it. Uh, so these are the preferences. Uh, so you recognize an Epstein's uh, utility formulation. VT is uh, utility. Uh, it's an aggregate of consumption today and uh, utility in the future. Uh, sigma, or well, 1 over sigma really, indexes the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. And uh, theta uh, is the degree of relative risk aversion. Uh, CT is uh, per capita consumption. There's going to be population growth, uh, and population is NT. And beta is uh, the discount factor, and I'm going to work a lot with uh, the uh, discount rate formulation. Uh, so that's 1 over beta uh, minus 1. Labor supply is going to be inelastic. Uh, and that's something that uh, could be relaxed. Uh, so for example, uh, market power markups is going to suppress factor supply. In this model, the only factor that's this, that has some elasticity is capital. So you'll see that it will lower the capital stock. It will lower investment. But it won't do anything to labor supply. If you added uh, labor supply elasticity, it would also suppress uh, labor supply. But we took that out uh, from the baseline estimation. Mm -hmm. uh, production is uh, very simple. Uh, you have uh, differentiated goods. The elasticity of substitution between these goods is epsilon, and the markup is going to be inversely related to epsilon, and that can be time varying. Uh, the production function for each of the varieties is going to be uh, constant returns to scale. In fact, Cobb Douglas between capital uh, and labor. And you see that you have two forms of technology shocks here, ZT and ST. ZT is going to be a TFP uh, trend, and it's going to be deterministic. And ST is going to be the, a stochastic trend, which is going to incorporate the shocks that are going to be uh, encapsulating the risk uh, in this model. So in our formulation, basically, you can think of ST as being constant unless there is an extreme event. It could be a disaster or it could be a bonanza. Okay? And in, if that happens, the realization of chi is either negative or positive with some small probability. That's uh, the framework we're going to be working with uh, empirically. So you can aggregate this economy. You get an aggregated production function, which is also Cobb Douglas and has this uh, familiar form. Capital accumulation is a standard. Uh, there are two little twists. The first one is the QT in front of the XT. XT is investment. Uh, so QT is the relative uh, uh, price, uh, is going to be the inverse of the relative price of investment goods. So it's going to be the efficiency of investment that's going to capture this relative decline, this decline in the relative price of investment goods. And then you see that capital is hit by this KIT, this KIT shock. Okay. So that's the trick that we're going to introduce, and it's really for tractability, is that this shock KIT, which is hitting the, the productivity of labor, 
is also hitting capital. What that's going to do is that you're going to be on a, a steady state with some constant big ratios. A shock is going to hit, and you're going to transition directly to the new steady state. So there's going to be no transitional dynamics. So you're always going to be in this risky steady state. And for that reason, the model is going to be uh, uh, amenable to a closed form characterization. So uh, a key equation in the model is going to be the Euler equation. In fact, that's the only uh, behavioral equation uh, in the model. Uh, MT is the stochastic discount factor, and RT plus 1K is the contingent return on capital. And it has two parts. The first part, alpha Y over mu K, is going to be the rental rate of capital, how much you can rent your capital for uh, in the next period. And uh, the second part, 1 minus delta over QT plus 1, is going to be the capital gains. Okay, and there, the price of capital is moving around, so, so there could be capital gains and losses. And you see that everything is multiplied by this shock, uh, KIT plus 1, so uh, the return on capital is going to be risky through this uh, variable. But all the other variables are, like Y over K is actually going to be, uh, to be constant. <coughs> so just a quick remark, just to, to warm up to, to the model. Why is alpha Y over mu K uh, the relevant measure of the, the rental uh, rate of capital, well, uh, you have this Cobb Douglas production function. Alpha is the, the technological share of capital, the elasticity of the production function to capital, but you have market power. Okay? So if there was no market power, alpha, alpha Y over K would be the return to capital. Alpha Y would be the share of capital, you divide by the stock of capital, you get uh, the rental uh, of capital. But because you have market power, uh, the rental share is going to be depressed. Okay, and that's why it's alpha over mu uh, that uh, shows up in there. Finally, you have the resource constraint, so goods can be either consumed or uh, invested. So as I told you, there's going to be a, a risky balanced growth path uh, in this economy. We're going to assume that uh, Z, which is TFP growth, N, which is population growth, and Q, which is the, the growth in the efficiency of investment, as are going to grow at constant rates. So then you're going to get a risky balanced growth path where uh, the, all the, the, the variables of interest are going to be uh, uh, basically scaled by a common stochastic trend. So there's a deterministic trend, that's the T, and there's a stochastic trend, that's the S, that incorporates the different productivity and capital quality shock that could be accumulating. So for example, output is going to be T times S times a constant Y star. Uh, investment X is going to be T times S times a constant X star, uh, etc. Okay, and you see the expression for the deterministic trend as a function of uh, the underlying structural trends uh, in this economy. So uncertainty uh, is not going to affect uh, the, the trend component is going to be incorporated in these constants, in these Y star, and these X stars, and, and the equivalent for the other variables. So risk and uncertainty, as much as market power and things like that, are going to affect this risky steady state, these big ratios, in a way that I'm going to uh, characterize. But you're always going to be in this risky steady state. No transitional dynamics, that's why it's going to be closed form, that's why it's going to be very transparent. So uh, just to reinforce the point, this is a graph that illustrates what could be going on. Uh, this is not meant to be empirically realistic. So here you see some, some trends, and there are some little blips. So the blips are the capital quality shocks and productivity shocks. Okay, so you see that they hit like output, consumption, and investment in a parallel way. When you have one of these shocks, and in this case I've drawn negative shocks, the realized return on capital is going to be very low. Okay? And then you revert to a period where you don't have any shock and the return to capital is going to be higher than the risk free rate because there's going to be a risk premium. Okay? And so the expected return on, uh, on, uh, on capital is going to have to compensate uh, for the risk. That's why it's above the risk free rate. So uh, now let me characterize the big ratios. And again, don't focus too much on the nitty-gritty details of the expressions, but just the logic of how the model is working. So there's one parameter that's going to be very important, 
And you see that uh, as a function of the underlying structural parameters, it's uh, a complicated expression that involves attitudes towards uh, intertemporal substitution, risk preferences, the amount of risk, the amount of patience. And it's, this R star is going to be the expected return on equity. Okay, so not the, the R star that we usually talk about, which is the risk free rate, but the expected return on equity. And it's going to be a very central variable uh, in this estimation. From that, we can get the user cost of capital. Okay, so the whole Jorgensen notion of the user cost of capital. So uh, what is this user cost? Well, you have to compensate capital for the, re the risk it's bearing. That's why the expected return is R star. You have to compensate for depreciation. That's why you have to add delta. And you have to compensate for uh, the, the capital loss because the capital is getting cheaper over time. Okay, so that's why you have the GQ uh, over there. And the rental rate has to compensate uh, exactly uh, for that. That's the logic of this expression. And importantly, R star is not the risk-free rate. So a lot of implementations of the whole Jorgensen formula plug in for this R star, the risk-free rate. For example, uh, an important paper in this market power literature is the paper by Barkai. And he estimates a markup with a user cost approach, very much like this one, and he plugs in the risk-free rate for R star. And as you've seen, the risk-free rate is plunging over this time period. Okay. And so you're going to be led to the conclusion that the user cost of capital is going way down. Okay, and uh, because of that, you're going to be led to the conclusion that the profit share is exploding. And if the profit share is exploding, that means that the markup is exploding. And they're going to find very high estimates of the increase in the markup over this time period. And if you have uh, an increase in R star, an increase in risk, that's going to mitigate this increase in markup. So that's going to be one of the important conclusions that's going to be coming out of the model. Continuing with the big ratios, you see the capital output ratio here. So uh, we have to uh, multiply capital by its price okay, to divide it by output. So QT is the relative price of capital as a function of output, so this ratio is unitless. And you see the expression for this ratio, and it's very intuitive. So if the technological capital share of capital alpha, the elasticity of the production function to capital is higher, you're going to have more capital. If uh, the market power parameter, if markups are higher, you're going to get less capital. Why? Because if you want to exercise market power, if market power is being exercised at the economy level, output is being restricted. So there's not that much need for, uh, for investment and for capital. So that's why the mu is in the denominator. Similarly, if uh, capital is very risky uh, uh, and leading to a very high R star, then that's going to deter uh, investment. Uh, we can compute uh, another sort of big ratio, which is relatively new, is not in the standard uh, you know, macro or growth literature, but it was one of the motivating stylized facts that I've gave you, is this spread between the marginal product of capital that seems to be relatively constant over the sample and the declining risk-free rate. So uh, MPK is this uh, return to capital, and it's the profit rate divided by uh, the value of capital. And we're taking the spread between that and the risk-free rate. And you see there, there are three things that could be explaining this spread as a matter of accounting. The first one is depreciation. Okay, so if you invest in the risk-free rate, your capital doesn't depreciate. If you invest in capital, it does. So you're going to require higher uh, marginal product to compensate for that. That's the first term. So it could be, for example, that like, you know, there's some action in the depreciation rate or in the investment bias technical change over the sample that would explain the behavior of this spread. The second component is rents. So there are markups in this economy. There are pure profits. These pure profits are there only if mu is greater than 1. Okay, and these profits are going to show up in this accounting measure of the marginal product of capital. So part of the gap that's developing between this measure of MPK and the risk-free rate could be pure profits, economic rents. And finally, the last part is the gap between the expected return on equity and the risk-free rate. 
So if the risk premium is rising, if the expected return on equity is relatively constant and the risk free rate is falling, that's going to open up a gap again between the MPK, uh, the measure of MPK and the measure of the risk free rate. So these are the three possible explanations at this stage for the uh, increasing gap between MPK and RF. Depreciation slash investment specific technical change, rents and risk. And you see that because this gap is increasing over time, it has to be trends in these things. So it has to be that depreciation has increased over time, it has to be that rents have increased over time, or it has to be that risk has increased uh, over time. And to give you away a bit of the punchline, what we're going to find is that it's about 50-50 between rents and risk. Okay. Uh, and depreciation is going to play a relatively small role. The price dividend ratio is another uh, financial big ratio, and it's given by this uh, garden growth formula. Okay, so GT is the growth rate of TFP, that's going to be the growth rate of dividends as well. And so the price dividend ratio is going to be 1 over R star minus uh, GT. And importantly, again, in this ratio, what we should plug in is the expected return on equity and not the risk free rate. The risk free rate has declined a lot. Okay, the price dividend ratio has only increased slightly over the sample. If you plug in the decline in the risk rate that we've observed in the data, the price dividend ratio, which is high, should be even higher. So the fact that it has increased only moderately is going to be an indication, according to our estimation, that R star, uh, that the risk premium has increased, that R star has not declined as much as the risk free rate. And finally, you can get the equity premium as the gap between the expected return on equity uh, and the risk-free rate, and it's a function only of risk uh, aversion, the parameter theta, and the amount of risk, which is governed by uh, the shock, chi t plus one. You can also characterize the other big ratios. Uh, this is the investment to capital ratio. So investment to capital, alpha and mu are not going to enter in there. And the reason you just need, in steady state, you just need to replace the capital stock. And that's what this equation uh, is saying. But the investment output ratio is going to depend on alpha, on mu, and on R star. Okay? So uh, if alpha is higher, then you're going to get more investment. If mu is higher, more market power, investment is going to be lower. And uh, if R star is higher, if there's a lot of risk in the economy, then uh, investment output is going to be relatively low. And finally, you get the uh, shares of income. So the labor share is 1 minus alpha over mu. So what could be driving down the labor share is either technical change away from labor and towards capital or an increase in market power. The capital share is alpha over mu and the profit share is mu, mu minus one over mu. So when mu is equal to one, no markups, uh, the profit share is equal to zero and we recover uh, the standard uh, formulation. So let me try now to uh, implement this uh, accounting framework. What we're going to do is fit the model to these two subsamples, okay, and assume that we're in this risky steady state in these two subsamples. So it's obviously a bit of uh, uh, there's a bit of hand weaving there because we're transitioning from one risky steady state to another risky steady state with different parameters. So there's got to be some transitional dynamics, and we're not going to take care of these transitional dynamics in the baseline. So what we do in the paper is we have an extension where we incorporate the transitional dynamics and we show that it doesn't make a big difference. The drawback is obviously that we're doing some violence to the mapping between the model and the data. The advantage is the transparency of the exercise. Uh, so you're going to see exactly how things are, are identified. Another thing that's a bit tricky if you want to really uh, sort of match the model dynamically is that you have to uh, take a stand on expectations. So you have this trend that you see in the data with the benefit of hindsight. What you don't know is what's in the agent's minds when they form their expectations in real time. And that turns out to be pretty important. So if you do uh, something that's very forward looking with a lot of uh, foresight, uh, the, the, the transition looks a bit crazy. But if you uh, assume that there's a lot of uncertainty or some myopia, then it behaves a lot better and you get results that are very consistent with what I'm going to show you. So here are the, the nine parameters uh, that we're going to, that we have to uh, estimate. 
and uh, the model is exactly identified. So we're going to uh, introduce exactly nine targets for these nine uh, parameters. So let me talk you through them and through what I'm going to interpret them to represent. So beta is the discount factor, and I'm going to take that to be a saving supply. So if the representative agent gets more patient, uh, um, uh, that means that the desire for savings uh, increases. We're going to have, uh, uh, the, the risk is going to take this disaster form. So uh, you either have no, uh, something completely deterministic, or with some private EP, you have a very bad shock, a disaster, uh, or you have a very good shock, uh, a bonanza. Okay? And I'm going to take a stand on the severity of the disaster. I'll show you that uh, later, which is in line with what Barrow uh, has done, and estimate this P, the probability of a disaster. But really, for a lot of the estimation, the only thing that we're going to need is the amount of risk and not the specific form that we're imposing. Mu is markup, is market power. Uh, the, you have TFP growth, population growth. Alpha uh, is the, technic uh, the technical share of capital. And if alpha changes, we're going to interpret that as a factor bias technical change. So the identification is almost recursive. Uh, there are things that are completely direct, so the rate of population growth, of investment prices, of TFP, employment to population ratio, that you read directly from the data, from matching the corresponding B ratios. You can infer delta from uh, the investment to capital equation. You can infer R star from the price dividend ratio using the Gordon growth formula. You can, uh, given these uh, quantities, you can infer alpha and mu by observing the labor share and the measure of marginal product of capital. So you see how mu is determined, for example. It's a function of the gap between the MPK and uh, the user cost and of uh, the difference between one and the labor share. And you see how the technological parameter uh, is estimated. From that, you can infer uh, what the ERP is. And for some of the other moments, like beta, for example, or P, uh, then we need to, to put a little more structure uh, on, uh, on the model. And uh, so we're going to put this structure, and that's uh, um, going to be irrelevant for the identification of alpha, the technological parameter, and mu, the markup. It's going to be relevant only to estimate things like beta and p. So these are assumptions that we're going to make. The risk is going to take this disaster form. So with probability 1 minus 2p, nothing happens. With probability p, uh, you have a bonanza. With probability p, you have a, a disaster. And the expectation of the shock is equal to 1. These are the preference parameters that I'm picking. It's relatively standard for a macrofinance calibration. Risk aversion is relatively high. We have to uh, match a, a high risk premium. So it's 12, but it's not crazy. And the IS is equal to, to 2, and the shock size is equal to 15%. So from that, we're going to recover beta, P, uh, and BH. So here are the estimated parameters. Uh, and you see their value in the two different stem samples, and then the difference. So the discount factor beta, that's the saving supply. So you see that it has increased a little bit. So there's some room for an increase in general saving supply uh, over the sample. The markup according to our estimates, has increased from something like 8% to something like 15%. So it's an increase of roughly 7%. It's a big increase in the markup. It's much smaller than some of the estimates of the increase in the markups that you might have seen uh, in the literature and that don't take into account uh, this finance perspective, this, uh, the, the possibility of a rising risk premium. So the Barca estimates, for example, increase a lot more. Uh, than, than this estimate. You see that the disaster probability, the amount of risk in the model, increases from 3% to uh, 6%. So there's an increase, there's going to be an increase in risk premium, and that's what's going to be tempering the rise in the markup. The Cobb Douglas parameter is relatively stable, uh, and you'll see that's going to be one big difference with the macro macro calibration, where it's going to be moving in weird ways. Uh, if you try to decompose the spread between the marginal product and capital and RF, uh, the spread has increased from 11% to 15%. That's a change of 4%. And it's, about, it's accounted 50-50 by rents, uh, by an amount something like 2%, and by the risk premium, something like 2%. So the reason this gap between the MPK and the risk-free rate is opening is because there's more risk and because there are more rents. 
and it's about 50-50 between these two explanations and depreciation plays a minor role. You can look at the income distribution. So uh, this is uh, the labor share, you see that it's declined. The true capital share, the rental share, the technological capital share has declined also, and the profit share has increased. Uh, you can also do rolling window estimation. So these are 10-year rolling windows. And what you see, for example, here is the total spread between MPK and RF. It's increased from 8 to something like 16. And you see that it's driven by the green and the red. So the green is the increase in rents in market power, and the red is the increase uh, in risk. So this explanation, this, the rolling window gives a little more uh, role to rents uh, uh, compared to risk. This is the income distribution and as a rolling window. So the red line is the true capital share. The, blue, the green line is the profit share. And you see that it's increasing from something like 55 to something like 15. And the blue line is the capital share that you would plug in a solar residual. Okay? So that's the true capital share that we're not measuring plus the profit share, whatever is not going to labor. And that's increased uh, from 30 to 35 percent because the increase in rents uh, is bigger than the decrease in the true capital share. <laughs> this is the composition of expected returns. Uh, the red line is the, uh, the expected return on equity. You see that it's relatively stable. The green line is the decline in the risk-free rate. And the blue line is the gap between the two. And you see that uh, we're uh, documenting, according to this estimation, an increase in the expected rib premium from something like 4% to something like 5.5% uh, over the sample. We can also use the model not just to do estimation and accounting, but counterfactuals. Uh, so uh, for example, you can do a counterfactual. Uh, so we're doing a counterfactual, it's a nonlinear model. So we're doing them one by one. Okay, what's the contribution of each parameter if you keep all the other parameters constant? So the variable that we're trying to decompose is like output or investment, the equity premium, etc. And we're looking at the contribution of beta, of mu, of p. So you see that for output, uh, the increase in savings supply is increasing potential output but that the increase in market power is decreasing potential output and the increase in risk is also decreasing potential output. And overall, potential output is down because of these evolutions by something like 0.3%. Uh, Investment uh, is down quite a bit by 5%. And uh, again, you have these countervailing effects. The increase in savings supply is pushing investment up. It would have been 17% higher, but because of the increase in market power and the increase in risk, uh, investment is actually down. And the contribution is about 50-50 between market power and risk. The equity premium is higher and is explained entirely by the increase in risk. The risk-free rate is lower, and that's explained about 50-50 by the increase in saving supply and 50-50 by uh, uh, the increase in risk. Okay, so there's more risk in the economy, People are, are, uh, there's some precautionary savings, and that drives down the interest rates. It's an important factor, uh, almost 50% uh, of the decline in the risk-free rate. Finally, for the price-dividend ratio, you see that if you only had the increase in beta, the price-dividend ratio should have increased by 31%. In fact, it increased only by 7%, by 7 points. And so uh, everything is explained by uh, the increase in risk and by some of the other factors. You can add intangibles by uh, assuming that we're mismeasuring the amount of capital. Uh, so the idea is that there are some investment that we're not capitalizing. We're treating them as intermediate expenditure. Really, they're uh, uh, building some kind of capital stock. So we're underestimating investment, underestimating the capital stock. And uh, if you do that, then uh, you overestimate the marginal product of capital. Okay, because the profit rate is accurately measured, you see that in the data, but the capital stock is too low compared to what it really is. So uh, that means that in the spread between MPK and RF, you're going to have now something that's going to be mismeasurement of intangibles. And if that mismeasurement is rising over the sample, then that's going to account for some of the increase in the spread. But even if we make a, relatively, a, a rather extreme assumption, it's not going to change that much uh, to the estimation. Okay, there's just, I mean, even if you assume that the mismeasurement increased from 10% to 20% of capital, Okay, which is very large. Uh, the share of IPP in investment is about 6%. So that's a very large increase in intangible. That makes a minor difference to the estimation. And interestingly, uh, the, the part that's being reduced 
in the contribution of the spread between MPK and RF is the rent part, is not the risk premium part. So if you do a comparison with a, a macro estimation, so macro estimation discards risk in the model and discards the price dividend ratio. That's the way you do typically RBC or New Keynesian models. You say, well, we don't know the equity premium. It's too complicated. We don't know how to explain it and things like that. And so you discard these financial moments. And you estimate the model without the price dividend ratio and without the risk. So a macro uh, calibration. So what you have is a much bigger increase in beta. It would be 2.8%. We only have 1.2%. The increase in market power is gigantic. Okay, it goes from 16% to 33%. So it's a 17% increase in the market. This is colossal, okay? much bigger than the 7% that we find. The, because this increase in the market that you need to explain the gap between MPK and RF is so big because you give no room for risk, so the market is increasing a lot. That means the labor share is going to go down like crazy. But of course, the labor share declined, but not that much. So you actually need to have technical change that's biased towards labor to sort of stabilize the labor share. So you see that the alpha coefficient, uh, the share that goes to capital, declines from 18% to 12%. It's a 6% decline. It's very large. So if you do this macro calibration, you're led to the conclusion that you've, we've seen labor bias technical change in massive proportions over the last 20 years, uh, which I think will uh, strike you as very counterintuitive. This is comparing as a rolling window on a very long sample from the, the 1950s onwards, uh, the macro estimation, which is the solid line, and the macro finance estimation, which is uh, the other line. So I'm showing you two parameters, beta, and mu. You can focus on the second one, mu market power. You see that if you do the macro estimation, you see this huge increase in markups from the 1980s to the present, but it's the trough of the 1980s. There's also a big decline in the markup from the 1950s uh, onwards. So huge swings uh, in market power. The macro finance estimation produces much more stable estimates of the markup, and the reason for that, of course, is that uh, risk is moving around and is picking up uh, some of the slack. I don't have time for the related evidence on, on risk premium, but if you try to estimate the equity risk premium with all the available methods that are out there, and I really mean all the available methods, what you find is an increase uh, in the risk premium. You should put very large standard errors around these estimates. It's very hard to estimate the risk premium in real time, but this is what you find with all these methods, and it's roughly in line with, uh, with what we get. Uh, you can look at risk in other places. Uh, in particular, you can look at risk in the bond market. So here, this is the Gilchrist and Darsec uh, uh, spread, for example. You see that it's increased a bit. The BEA spread, the AAA spread have increased a bit. VIX is the one that uh, doesn't work uh, uh, so well. Uh, and realized vol has increased quite a bit. So the evidence for increasing risk premia in, uh, in equities it comes out more strongly. It comes out a bit in the corporate bond market. The VIX is a bit the thing that, uh, that, looks, uh, that looks odd. So uh, let me conclude. Uh, this was an accounting exercise disciplined by a standard uh, neoclassical framework. The key was to study all these macro finance trends jointly. You cannot estimate them separately because an explanation that you're proposing for one fact has ripple effects for uh, the other facts. The substantive conclusion that we reach is that uh, there's an increase in macro risk, a secular increase in macro risk over the sample that plays a role that's as important uh, as market power. So we're not saying that there's no increase in market power. We're saying that the increase in market power is much more limited than what you've seen in uh, some other papers. Uh, and uh, we could also extend this framework to uh, incorporate other explanations like an open economy and other targets and things of that sort. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, one of the papers claiming its market power will be presented tomorrow morning. So, <laughs> uh, the pa this paper will be discussed by Jaume Ventura. Very good. Okay, first, uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me here and to discuss precisely this very interesting paper. This is, a, this is a paper that wants to cover a lot, 
it's a paper that is very ambitious. And it's a paper that is actually quite, uh, quite interesting and provocative in the results it has. The way I'm going to discuss it is I'm going to go through the paper a little bit as I read it and give you some of the comments that uh, came to mind as I went along. Okay? Let me be precise first on what the paper does. Um, gets a little bit cut, but it's okay. So basically, uh, the, first, the first thing that you see from the paper is that uh, what uh, Emmanuel and Francois do is basically to take a standard Ramsey model, like we study in textbooks, like the first uh, class in your advanced macro or graduate macro class, and you add two elements to it. The first is Epstein's in preferences. That plays no real role other than giving you the ability to break the two coefficients of intertemporal elasticity of substitution and the coefficient of risk aversion. And the second one is to add monopolistic competition, which is to give some market power and have a role for this market power. Everything else, the, the model works exactly like the standard Ramsey model. That was one of the first surprises I got. Because when I was thinking about macro and finance, uh, there has been a lot of research in macro and finance understanding how important is finance for macro and so on, but there were no financial frictions whatsoever in the model. Yeah, so that was, in a sense, a bit of a surprise for me. I was expecting how introducing some frictions in financial markets would help us understand uh, some of the issues or, or so on and so forth. That's not the case. It's just we can go back to a standard macro without uh, these frictions, and perhaps the models have a lot to tell us, just as long as we uh, do take the possibility of risk into account. And that's what comes from the next assumption. The next assumption says we had a shock uh, that keeps the economy in the steady state, but it creates risk. And they do that in a very clever way. They have a shock that uh, when happens, it changes both the capital stock and the effective labor supply in exactly the same way so that it doesn't affect the capital labor ratio. And as a result, it does affect, however, the risk on your consumption, because when it's a negative, your consumption declines, you can work less, your capital is worth less. When it is positive, the consumption increases, and that risk in your consumption ends up being affecting all the prices in the economy in a very simple way. I think this is an interesting uh, aspect of the model. Then what they do is to take that model and calibrate it twice. The first time they took the average of a series of variables, the most important ones are the ones that I put in the slide, the gross profitability, gross capital share, investment capital ratio, the risk free rate, the price dividend ratio, and they look at the averages for 1984-2000, and they calibrate the model, they use particular, there are nine, nine but in the matter of fact, with these five is enough, and five variables, okay, or nine and nine variables, depending on how you look at it. And that gives you exact identification for that period. And then you take the averages of these variables for the period 2001 and 2016, and you get different values of the parameters, you compare them, and somehow you attribute to the different changes in the parameters the importance on the difference on the values of these variables. One of the uh, when you do that, um, basically, when you are comparing these calibrations, you get some output which is like this. This uh, probably is going to be hard to read. It's taken exactly from the paper, but this is the bottom line. It's just to give you a little bit what this is going after. So here, for example, you, oh, this is not working. There is no... The pointer works? No. You don't see it, no? No. Okay, well, you see on the vertical side, you see gross profitability, measured capital share, risk free rate, that's what we are trying to match. You see on the top the different parameters. Beta is a discount rate, or what uh, is called the supply of savings. Um, mu is the market power or the markup. P is this probability of disaster. Uh, delta is the depreciation rate, alpha is the coefficient in the production function, GN, GZ, and GQ are different growth rates, growth rates of the labor force, of uh, productivity, total factor productivity, GQ is the growth rate of the price of investment, so the relative price of investment and consumption goods, and N bar is the share of the whole population that is working. 
okay? So these variab variables at the, on, the, on the top are the parameters that we are calibrating. And we calibrate using data for the parameters that are, for the variables that are on the column. And what you see is a target change over the two periods, and that's the difference. And then these numbers there in this matrix tell us how much of the change of that particular variable is due to the change of a particular parameter. So for example, you see gross profitability on top was 14.101 in 1984, 2000, then it increased to 14.89, and of that increase you can see that beta uh, actually doesn't explain much, it explains actually the opposite and it has to be made up by market power, by P, which is the, the, the risk probability and alpha, uh, delta a little bit, alpha doesn't play a role and so on and so forth, all the variables, you see? So that is kind of a distribution of who is guilty for that particular change. Okay, and that's the output of this. At the end of the day, you say there were all these changes, there were these changes in the parameters, these were the shocks, the one on the top, and each of them is guilty. And then the whole paper goes into the narrative of describing these numbers, what do they tell us? And in particular, these numbers tend to tell that P plays an important role. P plays an important role and P is risk. Okay, the probability of a disaster happening. Let me tell you a little bit about the questions, about uh, how to use that. Uh, the paper is very well written. You can see that also from the presentation, which was very clear on all the results. And I want to talk a little bit about the kitchen, how this is cooked. Eh? The first thing that I have as a question to Emmanuel and Francois is how did they choose the, the time periods? Why did they choose uh, 84 to 2000? and 2001 to 2016. Obviously, it seems that it breaks the sample exactly in the middle, and that could be one of the things, but if there are a bunch of shocks that make the economy change, you would like to break it at the time where the shocks happen, basically. This is more like trends than like shocks, and if you go a little bit, I don't know why, this is not, okay, now. So for example, for some of the variables, when you look at the long-term real interest rate, these are the two periods. Obviously, it seems like a smooth change rather than a, than a, than a big break. For some others, like the gross profitability, I'm not so sure there's a big change or not. Uh, the price dividend ratio, that definitely seems a little bit arbitrary to make it in the middle of the, uh, at the moment in which the dot-com bubble basically burst. And in the investment GDP ratio, I also don't see a huge change. I would like to ask whether the results are sensitive to other breakpoints. They do something later on in the paper, which is to look at the long time series of 50, since 1950, and look at rolling windows of 11 years. And some of the results are similar, although the paper in the version I got didn't comment too much about the similarities of this long uh, sample and the one that you uh, do here. It would be interesting to see whether you break it a little bit later around the crisis or a little bit earlier before the bubble, whether the results would be very similar or very different. I don't know. Since there was a little bit of change in financial markets during these periods, I would like to understand a little bit more that. Then there is, there is uh, another comment I would like to do. In order to produce this table, to compute the numbers on the right, basically they do uh, quite a complicated procedure in which basically these are averages of contributions of many possible changes. Let, let, me, let, me, let me be clear. Today, nine variables change. And I want to decompose what is the contribution of each of the variables. Of course, I could do something. Assume eight change and one didn't. And then I would contribute, that would be the, contrib uh, what the difference that I observe between that exercise and the exercise in which the nine change could be the contribution of the other variable. But I could say none changes and one changes. Or I could say three change, five don't change, and one, what difference does it make? Well, these results are the, the average of all possible combinations. And I don't know how to interpret that very well. And I would like perhaps a little bit of help in interpreting that. Probably sticking to the usual one of saying all change except for one. 
might be a little bit better and probably uh, I'm sur I wouldn't be surprised if the results are similar, but I think it would be a little bit better for interpretation. The main comment I want to do is about the identification strategy and the central role that the Gordon formula plays in this identification strategy. Basically, when you go and you calibrate the model, the first thing that you do is to obtain growth rates of population, TFP, price of investment goods, and ratio of labor of to population from data. That's why I say that, in fact, you are only measuring five variables whatsoever. And then you take one formula, which is the Gordon formula there. The price dividend ratio is one over R star minus GT. GT is a combination of the growth of productivity and population. Okay? And you say, and you estimate R star from this formula. And this R star is going to be the key piece that will help you get all the ratios right or wrong and all the other variables. Once you have the R star, then you can calculate the risk premium. And given the particular formula that they have on the risk premium, that gives you the P. The risk premium depends on risk tolerance to risk, depends on the magnitude of the disaster. These are fixed. And what we get is the probability of the disaster. Uh, the same, R star gives you the time preference rho plus some risk adjusted growth measure given by the model, one over the intertemporal elasticity substitution. The second term is all given, and rho is estimated based on R star and some numbers on this. So the savings shock, the rho, is obtained from R star. The same from the market power, the marginal product of capital is obtained as the average product of capital in the economy, which is a reasonable thing. The depreciation, some labor share, ILS, but you get R star there. So basically all the numbers that the paper obtains are based on this Gordon formula. Do we really trust the Gordon formula? Has it done very well over this period? I want to conclude just by telling you that the time I used that Gordon formula, it did very poorly. Actually, uh, I, it was, I tried to use some net present value formula to calculate the value of assets in the US together with Vasco Carvalho at, uh, at Cambridge and with Alberto Martin uh, sitting here. And we went and we took the value of assets of the United States from 1950 to 2008. And we used the formula to calculate the net present value that we took from Schiller which is a standard, eh, which looks like the, has as a special case the Gordon formula. So basically, we computed, um, we estimated the cash flows, we computed the expected returns uh, out of sample consumptions and so on, and we found that the formula does extremely bad exactly in the period that we are analyzing. And I am wondering, are you so confident about the Gordon formula even in its most simpler form, which is a fixed pri uh, price to dividend ratio and some productivity growth taken from national accounts and total fractal productivity for this R, I would somehow try to think about what happens if there is a bubble. You have written on bubbles and you have argued in some of your papers that they have been an important element. Perhaps it would be interesting to introduce some bubble component and see how, as you change the bubble component, some of your results uh, can change, and you can use some of the, some of the estimates of these bubble components uh, as, a, as a residual from, uh, from uh, these calculations of the Gordon formula to see whether, um, whether the things uh, change a little bit more. Overall, nevertheless, as I tell you, we all can pick on one particular thing. This is trying to put lots of facts together. Um, I just happen to think that the Gordon formula is not going to work for assets, uh, and there are various papers that show that. Uh, this is my, my, main, uh, my main comment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jaume. Um, we have uh, six minutes for Q&A, so the floor is open for questions for Emmanuel. Frank? Uh, two, two short questions about so some of the sources of what's behind the, the main changes, which I understood is beta on the one hand, or at least if I think about the, the, the fall in the equilibrium rear interest rate beta, 
and the probability of, uh, of a disaster. Um, the beta, should I, I mean, so if, if you look at the literature on, on, on what can de explain over time and across countries, real rates, demographics, and, and population aging in particular, is probably one of the more robust variables. So the, my question is, is that what you think is the main factor behind that? And what does that then imply for how these things will evolve uh, in the future? And have you done extension with an OLG type of model where you could, could capture this uh, more, more directly? And on the disaster probability, I mean, another fact or trend, I think, which is still there is the, the sort of the great moderation. Now, there has been sort of an interruption, but at least the Rogoff in the recent uh, sort of paper uh, claims that uh, actually when you look through that, it's still, it's still there. That kind of contrasts a little bit with uh, sort of the idea that risk has actually increased. Now, of course, these are different types of risks. Uh, so I was just wondering whether you've thought about, about, uh, about that. All right, um, Emmanuel, you want to respond? Yes. Uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Jaume, and thanks, Frank, for the question. And I'll start with Frank and, and uh, finish with, uh, with Jaume. So in the model, you, the decline in the risk-free rate, as you correctly noted, is explained by uh, roughly 50-50 by two forces, the increase in beta and the increase in P. So beta is the, the patient's parameter. The representative agent is more patient. And P is the disaster probability. It's mm -hmm. the amount of risk. So obviously, the, and, and this links to a comment that Jaume made, it's a model that's extremely simple. Uh, there's a representative agent which like, aggregates all the sorts of imperfections that we might think are in there, like financial frictions and things of that sort. And so, for example, risk aversion could be increasing over time. And that could also be driving uh, the, the increase in the equity risk premium. And this increase in risk aversion could come at some times because the financial sector is stressed. We're comfortable with that interpretation, even if the model doesn't have uh, that level of details. For beta, I think demographics is uh, precisely the sort of things that we think that beta is capturing. But again, it's a bit of a reduced form at this stage because we have this representative agent. So if we, we thought about extending the model uh, to uh, incorporate these particular details and to do a, an OLG model uh, you know, where you have a rich uh, life cycle component where you can really think about life cycle savings and uh, their implications for aging. We didn't do it because partly it's quite complicated, partly because I think there's a lot that we felt we don't know uh, about how to discipline that model. For example, uh, we don't know enough, I think, about how uh, retired people versus active people invest their portfolios. So it could be, for example, that when you're retired, you're more conservative in the way you invest your portfolio. Okay, and so that would tend to make, so aging in that case would not only make people more patient, but it will also make them more risk averse on average. So it could be that uh, demographics is behind the increase in P, the, in beta and the increasing in P. So I think it would be very interesting to open up that, that black box, but I think we'd also need to not just like ramp up the modeling, but bring in more, more data that we, we weren't exactly sure uh, where to get. But I think that would be a very uh, interesting extension. For uh, the increase in P and like the, the, the great moderation, well, I, as, you, as you noted in your question, the risk in our model takes a different form. It's this disaster risk that's sort of looming over the economy and affecting asset prices and investments and things like that, but you wouldn't see it in day-to-day -day volatility or year-to-year -year volatility. So on the face of it, it's consistent with the great moderation. I think like the, this clash is also a bit what we're picking up when we're looking at the VIX. Uh, you see that the VIX is not increasing that much uh, between the two samples. And the VIX, I think, is picking up more of the great moderation sort of thing than the, the disaster risk that we're thinking. So I think the clash that you, that you saw is also showing up in these, some of these alternative measures that we're looking at. Uh, so I think you have to be open to the possibility that there are other sources of risk than just the year-to-year -year, uh, volatility uh, in, uh, in output. Uh, 
Let me move to uh, to to Jaume. So uh, your first comment was about the the, the level of uh, stylization in the model or the lack of texture. And it's true that we don't have financial frictions, for example. It's not because we believe that financial frictions are not important. Obviously, they are. We just wanted to write something that was very simple and then interpret some of the parameters as a bit reduced form stand-in for other stories that you could be uh, you could be telling. So I think it's the style of, of the paper and there are pros and cons. If you bring in more texture, then you have to discipline more details of the model that you're not sure about. So it's a world of trade-offs, uh, basically. For, uh, you had another comment which was about the, the time period. And, uh, and the fact that we're splitting the sample in two. So there was a bit of a disagreement between the two co-authors there. Uh, I thought that to capture these trends, it would be better to, do, to put more emphasis on the rolling windows, and Francois was more attached to, to the split. The reason we put the split there is first because it's in the middle of the sample, so it's relatively neutral. And I think, like based on some uh, other narrative evidence, we think that there's kind of a, a bit of a structural break that happens there. So if you look at the price dividend ratio, for example, I mean, that sort of neutralizes the, the NASDAQ bubble. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's imperfect. And I think it would be a good idea to explore the sensitivity to, to different breaking points or to comment more on whether the rolling window estimates are consistent with the, the break. Um, in the middle. Um, for these tables that try to decompose the effects of the different variables, so these are really to be interpreted as counterfactuals. Of course, it's a nonlinear model, so to assess what's the contribution of one particular explanation uh, is difficult. Uh, in a linear model, you know, you have five things that are moving, and if you sum these five things, that adds up to the whole effect. In the nonlinear model, it doesn't work like that, and there's some arbitrariness as to how you do this decomposition. So we decided to do it in this particular way, but I guess probably we could document some robustness with respect to that, and in particular show the, the particular specification uh, that you had in mind. And finally, for uh, identification, so uh, a quick comment on this. The first thing is um, the, the Gordon growth formula per se. So we rely on this for the estimation, that's absolutely correct. Uh, then we do this robustness in the conclusion where we look at different ways, actually all the possible different ways that you could estimate the equity risk premium. So there's a large literature on this. Uh, there are different methods. So there are these time series methods that are based on some elaborations, basically, of the garden growth formula, where Campbell and Schiller are doing. Basically, you try to forecast dividend growth, and, and then you back out uh, the expected return and the, and the risk premium from there. So all of these methods document an increase in the risk premium that's in the ballpark uh, of, of what we have. You also have cross-sectional methods. So cross-sectional methods, they look at stocks that have a higher beta than others, so riskier stocks. And then they try to look at the different in realized returns between, uh, between stocks of, uh, of different categories or price dividend ratios of stocks of different categories. So it's not estimated of the time series, but of the cross section. And these methods also find an increase in risk premium. Of course, like you can quibble with the, the fact that the CAPM is not a fantastic model, but that's different debate. Uh, the bubble. Um, one of the things that I think our break in 2000 is doing is to neutralize a bit this ramp up in the price dividend ratio and the collapse. So there's one big event in valuations, which is basically the end of the 90s, and the, the price dividend ratio uh, increases, spikes, and then crashes. And one way you might want to go about modeling that is deviate from the sort of models that I've been writing and uh, that we've been writing here and to incorporate, let's say, a bubble, for example. And the only thing I can say is that by sort of putting this split in the, in the middle or by doing these long rolling windows, we're trying to like, smooth that out, basically. So in essence, I think what we're trying to do is to look at longer trends uh, in valuations and maybe smooth out some of the bubbles that maybe appear uh, at, uh, at shorter horizons. But uh, that's, the, that's the, the way I think about it. Anyways, uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>
Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, so here at the ECB, we actually present both the R star from the textbook and the R star in your model to the governing council. And so also with a variety of methods, we see that equity costs in the euro area has remained stubbornly high. And so there's this wedge that the risk premium has increased um, over yeah, the past 10, 20 years. So very consistent with the evidence you have for the US. Okay, so it's time for coffee. Um, we can double up on coffee. We have half an hour break, and uh, see you back at uh, about quarter to twelve. <laughs>